Though now we're moving on to memory and actually I should put this at the start of the video because I think it's very important information if you want to not only buy an X670E but also especially a Ryzen 9 7950X. And here is where with this memory we managed to get 6400 megahertz for 32 gigabytes, two 16 gigabyte sticks to work absolutely no problems. After that, I couldn't get it to boot, it wouldn't work properly. And even then at 6400 megahertz, it did crash in games. Shadow of the Tomb Raider crashed once. And so for me, 6200 megahertz would be the sweet spot. And even then that's running at 1.4 volt, which is a lot higher than the standard 1.1 volt. So for me personally, I don't know if I'd be comfortable running my memory at 1.4 volt. I'd go down to 6,000 at 1.25 volt. That seems to be a good sweet spot if you can tune your memory to those levels. So AMD weren't kidding when they said the 6,000 megahertz is the sweet spot. And the reason I say this is because we've actually got a 64 gigabyte kit in this system at the moment, which is really good for video editors, especially 4K video editing. And here's where the 6,000 megahertz profile maxed out. So that worked stable with a 64 gigabyte kit, though when we added in 128 gigabytes, here's where it would not boot at 5,200 megahertz even. And at 4,800 megahertz, it managed to boot. After that, it'd give us a 0D reading on the BIOS readout. So the CPU is not really that strong in terms of its IMC once you go past 64 gigabytes of RAM. Now the results did not differ at all between the Pro RS model and also the Tai Chi. So I managed to get the same memory potential out of the Pro RS as I did out of the X670E Tai Chi. So in other words, the CPU was our limiting factor, which is a good thing for future generations of CPUs to slot them in and get the most out of these motherboards. Today, we're going to be reviewing the X670E Tai Chi motherboard and also the X670E Pro RS motherboards from ASRock. If you are looking to get a Ryzen 9 7950X, then in my opinion, an X670E can make quite a bit of sense. However, there's a lot of differences between a lot of these different motherboards that AMD have released in not just the X670 lineup, but also the B650 lineup. So straight away, we'll go over what makes the Tai Chi different from say the Pro RS X670E board that we have here. And today we're gonna to be taking a look at both these boards in depth. We're gonna be giving you guys a full fledged review with this CPU, the 7950X overclocked, and we're gonna also be undervolting it and tuning it. But this CPU can be absolutely amazing for someone who wants to get the most out of it in terms of productivity. Depending on your application, this can beat the 13900K quite comfortably in your application, which you prefer. And so with that, if it's gonna be saving you a lot of time, then you're probably gonna to wanna to look into the motherboard that has the best feature set for you. So straight away though, we're gonna look at the price of the X670 Tai Chi. It's $500. It's actually one of the most steepest price points for a motherboard that I have seen in any platform release. And for this price though, you do get what I would consider ridiculous overkill on the VRM. It's actually over-engineered in my opinion, but you also get a lot of different feature set from even the X670 Pro RS. And so what I mean by this is, first of all, this has two X16 PCA5 compatible slots, as well as three M.2 NVMe PCA 5.0 slots, X4. So it's got different connectivity from the board itself, as opposed to the Pro IS here, which has its own unique play. And in my opinion, it's coming in at $280. And if I was to build a rig with the 7950X currently, I'd be using the X670 Pro RS. I think for the price point, given its 17 phase versus the 27 phase VRM, it gives you a lot of different functionality to the X670 Tai Chi, for example. And so if you're into say a private at home data center, or you want something that's more focused on using M.2 drives, this has a big advantage of supporting up to five M.2 drives natively from the board itself. Three of those being PCA 4X4, one of those being a PCA X2 Gen 3, as well as having SATA support. 
and then one of those being the M.2 PCA Gen 5 X4. Though back to the VRMs on both these boards, here is where you're getting on the Taichi a 27 true phase VRM in total, and you almost heard me laugh there because it is ridiculously good if you wanna keep temperatures low. And here's where I loaded up the 7950X on a 420 mil water cooler to the max that I possibly could. I got 5.3 gigahertz stable at 1.3 volt. And this is where we managed to draw 265 watts from the CPU. We could get this same voltage at 5.35 gigahertz, but it did crash. And this is where on the VRM itself, the highest point that we got when we used the thermal imaging camera to check VRM temperatures, the hottest spot was from actually around the CPU where the heat was coming out, where the CPU itself was almost reaching 110 degrees. So not really practical at all, but in terms of testing the VRM, I then had to zoom in and not get a part of the PCB that was making so much temperature. And this is something that I've never seen before where the area around the CPU is hotter than the area covering the MOSFETs or the heat sink around the MOSFET itself. So the max I could get here was 56 degrees on the MOSFETs and 42 degrees on the heatsink. This is in a 26C ambient environment. And then at a tuned setting of 180 watts, this is at 5.2 gigahertz all core, we're getting 46 degrees and 37 degrees. So before we move over to the ProRS numbers, I will say that the default numbers, I highly recommend you change the 7950X out of the box. I think it's tuned for 230 watts at 5.1 gigahertz all cores. And I just think if you're using it for productivity, you're most likely using it for all those cores. So you can get a much more efficient clock out of this by going to say 1.14 volt out of the box and you'll be using 180 watts, so down 50 watts and getting 100 megahertz extra out of your CPU, not to mention you'll keep the temperatures down. There's also, if you wanna save more power, there's 4.8 gigahertz at roughly 0.98 volt. So tuning this CPU is highly recommended with the 7950X. Though let's go over now to the X670E Pro RS with its 17 phase true phase VRM where it's using slightly inferior MOSFETs to the X670E Taichi. But even then, here is where when we absolutely maxed out that 7950X at 5.3 gigahertz, we got 65 degrees on the VRM and 46 degrees on the heat sink. And just like the Taichi, the hottest point was around the CPU, that PCB area. So I had to zoom in and focus on an area where that middle bit of the PCB around the CPU wasn't in the shot. So I could get some accurate readings here. But then if we went to the 180 watt sweet spot, we had 50 degrees and 38 degrees on the heatsink respectively. So the VRM numbers on both these motherboards was absolutely fine. And this is where if you want to spend that extra money on that X670E Taichi, for example, are you going to be getting your money's worth at this point in time? I would say no, because you've got support there, I think in total for, I gotta do the math off the top of my head, 44 PCIe 5.0 lanes, which you're only able to extract out of this point in time out of the Ryzen 9 7950X, 20 PCIe 5.0 lanes. So if you wanna go with the Taichi, I'd say you're making an investment now where you've got this extra future compatibility on the motherboard that can be unlocked with the newer generations of Ryzen CPUs that are to be released. And the good thing here with AMD, especially with AM5, is that they've proven with AM4 that they do have the track record of making, if you invest early in the motherboard, it having great longevity. And we did see this with some of those X370 motherboards where to this date, they were able to just upgrade through generations. And if you got an X370 Taichi, for example, that would have been one of the best motherboards of all time in terms of reusability. Though there's also two other very impressive features on the Taichi before we go back to the Pro RS, and that is you've got at the back USB 4.0, which also includes compatibility for uh, Thunderbolt 3 and 4, and you've got two of those ports. So very powerful. Then we go to the onboard audio, which is the best I have seen to date. And it's a good thing that they keep improving on this because you've got a Sabre ESS 9218 DAC. And then you've also got for the rear, the Realtek ALC 4082, which when I tested the numbers 
on the ESS Sabre DAC. This was giving us cross torque of under 90 decibels. It was also giving us pretty much a perfectly flat line through the frequency response curve with some ridiculously low distortion numbers. So this is gonna be great if you've got a variety of different headphones since this also does include automatic impedance sensing. And also when I plugged a mic in to the mic in port, there was also virtually no noise on the mic in port. So they've done a great job on the onboard audio where they've also separated the right and left channels via different layers. And speaking of layers, the good thing about ASRock boards, this time around with X670E, whether it's non-E or B650 and B650E, is that they're including eight layer PCBs on all their models of motherboards in this lineup. So for me personally, I always like to have at least a six layer PCB on my motherboard, especially it's in my personal rig, but the eight layer is definitely the cream of the crop. Though moving on to the X670E Pro RS, running the same tests here on the audio, that's using the Realtek ALC897, and this had around minus 87 decibels of crosstalk. It's also got a 1.9 decibel roll off, the frequency response was really solid and the distortion was relatively low. So not as good as the Tai Chi, but if you've got something like the ATH 500Xs like I use for my daily headphones when I need headphones, this will provide a really good experience with those headphones. The mic import did have a little bit of noise once we started moving past a 50 volume and a 30 dB boost. So my recommendation would be to move it down to say plus 20 dB at a volume level of 60 or 70. That will give you a great relatively noise-free recording, but you will need a sensitive mic to power it at high levels with that mic import. And with all those numbers finally finished and looking at the motherboard, it's time for me to give you guys my personal thoughts and opinions. And with that, a recommendation on both the X670E Pro RS and also the X670 Tai Chi. Now, we'll start off with the Pro RS because I feel like that's more relevant, especially for me personally, with $280 price tag versus the $500 price tag on the Tai Chi. It carries a 17 phase VRM, which was absolute overkill for even the Ryzen 9 7950X. And I do pause there and I do wonder, okay, even if in the future you have these CPUs with higher power consumption, there's going to be a limit there. I mean, if you're going up even to say 500 watts, you're getting into the realm of, it's going to be uncomfortable in your room. You're gonna to have to have extra air con or push the CPU heat out. When for me personally, I always try to keep that CPU undervolted and extract a sweet spot. Like I showed in the results today, the CPU really only needed 180 watts for what I'd be using it for if I was doing work on an X670E motherboard where the 7950X topped out at 5.3 gigahertz, but I'd run it at 5.2 gigahertz, and I'd do so at much lower voltages than it needed at 5.3 gigahertz. So finding the sweet spot is a big thing for me personally. And the Pro RS delivers on that front. It's also got all the room up to 265 watts where the 7950X maxed out on. So it did it with very comfortable levels on the VRM. So there's absolutely no problems there. The audio was great for mid-range cans, which is all I'm interested in using. I'm not a huge audiophile, and even when I do listen to audio, I like to listen on loudspeaker systems, which have their own separate DAC and amp. So the audio is absolutely fine. The 2.5 gigabits per second ethernet is absolutely fine too. You've got USB-C, which you can still run a lot of devices through that. Though also with the Pro RS, you still get PCIe 5.0 X16 up the top and you've got a PCIe 5.0 M.2 slot. And I will put a little bit of a focus on here before we shift over to the Tai Chi recommendation, because at least in the testing that ASRock showed me, they needed the heat sink with an active cooling solution to keep a PCIe Gen 5 SSD under control. So I'd be only going with a Gen 4 SSD at this point in time on my main system and waiting for Gen 5 to essentially, like literally actually cool down. Though if you wanna go with the Gen 5 SSD, then that's where the Tai Chi has an included active heat sink on board and it's a mammoth, I tell you now. Though I don't have a Gen 5 SSD to actually test this with, but ASRock showed the numbers, they're getting roughly 10 gigabytes transfers per second. This is where we go into the Tai Chi. The $500 price tag is everything that we're going to look at here. It's a lot to stomach especially since if we look at the first AM4 X370 Tai Chi that was released, that was $200. So you can see that 
nowadays, the I mean, it's not just inflation. The boards themselves, the license costs are going up and the feature set has gone up and ballooned out of control to the point where you have to ask yourself, do you need everything that the X670E Tai Chi has to offer? The things that impressed me about the board was the onboard audio was incredible. The VRM is too incredible to the point where I just don't think you are going to see an AM5 CPU in any way, shape or form, especially on a water or air cooler, need that sort of VRM. That's gonna be for pro overclockers in competitions where they've got liquid nitrogen and they're going for these crazy overclocks. That's where the Tai Chi is going to make a lot of sense. So this board is complete overkill and it's not really going to be a value play for a lot of people unless you're someone that could see yourself staying on AM5 indefinitely, you're sticking with AMD and you are definitely looking forward to using all that PCIe 5.0 expandability, whether it's two X16 slots or the three M.2 PCIe Gen 5 X4 slots for M.2 SSDs. There's so much Gen 5 connectivity on this board, it's actually confusing me having to go back and talk about the connectivity on it. The last thing is the goodies included with the Tai Chi. You do get the heatsink, the active heatsink. You do get a USB 2.0 rear IO for extra two ports that can connect via your front USB port. On both the Pro RS and also the Tai Chi, you do get standalone Wi-Fi antennas. And then for some reason, I found this a little bit odd, the ProRS doesn't have that active M.2 heatsink or the USB 2 rear outs, but it does have a graphics card support holder which attaches to the motherboard. So I'd actually like to see this also on the Tai Chi, included in the Tai Chi. I think that could be a very useful feature for someone who is upgrading and wants to keep the same case and they've got a really good case, but they don't have a GPU support bracket and they're going say with some of these massive graphics cards that are coming out today. Mainly if you look at the size of the RTX 4090, that thing is a whopper. Then the final thing I will touch on here is that we've already checked out the live mixer, the B650 from ASRock. I thought that offered better value than both these motherboards here today. And I feel like that's going to be a trend that's going to continue at least for the current generation of CPUs that AMD have out on AM5. The B650 and also the B650E is just going to provide much more relevancy for a lot of people, even if they're someone doing productivity, or if you're like me, you're using a single M.2, which a lot of the B650 and the E editions offer that Gen 5 compatibility on M.2. They've also got the PCA 5.0 X16 slots that the X670Es feature. They just, on X670E, you generally get the more USB connectivity as well as the SATA ports, as well as the X8, PCIe 4 from the chipset itself. It has an extra eight lanes. And the final talking point with X670 versus B650 is that I believe personally, a lot of people are not going to utilize those extra features on X670, but everyone can utilize the savings from going and stepping down from X670 to B650. Since all these models also have great VRMs. I haven't come into one B650 or X670 motherboard that's had a bad VRM yet. I haven't heard of one yet. And that's a good thing for the end consumer, especially if they wanna go out and buy some of the cheaper B650s that exist. Also lastly, in relation to the X670E Pro RS and the Tai Chi, if you know you need the feature set out of either of these boards and you're willing to stomach the higher prices that are presented on these boards, then you will be in for at the very least a really good experience both these boards are quote unquote rock solid. I had no problems setting them up, no problems while I was doing all those benchmarks in terms of the motherboard and also no problems when I was gaming. So really good motherboards from ASRock. Although of course the $280 and the $500 price tags on these boards is something that you're gonna have to consider. And is that something that you can utilize and take advantage of? That is the question for you guys. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's review of these boards. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button. And also let us know in the comment section below, do you have any other thoughts and opinions or any questions about these boards? Love reading those thoughts and opinions as always. And I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Love reading those comments as always. And I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. If you stayed this far and you're enjoying that tech yes content, then be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell on the way out, and I'll see you next time. Peace out for now. Bye.